Those were the days. Wow, I'll tell you. You know, we came out here from New York, and when we arrived, well, the people out west, they just didn't know what a depression was. I mean, we were used to looking at blocks of people waiting in line for food, you know? I think it was 198 that came out on the train with us, and, and most of them were from New York City and New Jersey. Ed Devine, Company 1233, Camp Moran. Why did I join the three C's? No work. That was the only way we could work to get money. Clarence Wood, Company 948, Rosario Beach. When Franklin Roosevelt was sworn in as president in 1933, the United States was hopelessly mired in the depths of the Great Depression. One out of four workers had lost his job with no hope of finding a new one. And unable to meet their mortgage payments, a thousand families a day were forced to give up their homes. And for the youth of America, the situation was particularly grim. Young people with no job skills and no work experience had no hope of earning a paycheck no way to help put food on the family table. Now at the same time, America's forests and farmlands were suffering from decades of abuse. Erosion and drought had turned the country's heartland into a dust bowl, while fire, disease, and poor logging technique took their toll on the nation's woods. Just 17 days after his inauguration, President Roosevelt proposed a program for healing both the land and its people unemployed civilians, especially young men between the ages of 18 and 25, would be paid by the federal government for restoring and improving America's open lands. Congress agreed with surprising speed. And on April 17, 1933, the first recruit signed into the new Civilian Conservation Corps. The program was nicknamed Roosevelt's Tree Army after the millions of seedlings the Corps members planted across the United States. But the work performed by the three C's went beyond reforestation. They helped manage soil erosion, fought forest and grassland fires, and built excess roads and lookout stations for future fire control. Later, the Corps would also be used for disaster relief, historic restoration, and national defense. The country's national and state parks also benefited from the Civilian Conservation Corps. During the 1920s, the new age of the automobile had whetted America's appetite for public parks and campgrounds. But by the Depression years of the 1930s, public park development had virtually ground to a halt. For the Washington State Park System, the Three Seas Boys were a godsend, building roads, hiking trails, kitchen shelters, and caretaker cabins in parks all across the state. In October of 34, I went down and signed up to join the CCs at the foot of Virginia Street, I think, uh, just north of Pike Place Market. And the sergeant said, go out and get in that truck out front. So we walked out the door, and as I got into the truck, I looked down at the license plate, and it said Saltwater State Park. So I turned to one of the fellows, and I said, where is Saltwater State Park? I've never heard of that before. But we were just starting it. That's why no one ever heard of it before, because we built it. Albert Cranfield, Company 935, Camp Saltwater. Nearly three million unemployed Americans eventually served in the Civilian Conservation Corps. Some were World War I veterans, men in their 30s and 40s, who worked separately from the younger enrollees. Some were American Indians who worked at home on their own reservations. But most of the three C's were junior enrollees, single men under 25 whose family were already receiving public assistance. They signed up for six months enlistments, renewable up to two years. Juniors earned $30 a month, a classic dollar a day, about $25 of which was sent back home to their families. The boys themselves received the remaining $5 to spend, plus clothing, housing, medical care, 
and all the beans and stew they could eat. Recruits from Washington generally worked on projects in their own state. But the bulk of the nation's population lived east of the Mississippi, while most of the conservation work was waiting for them out west. Thousands of eastern enrollees were herded onto trains and shipped to places so far away they might as well be on the moon. The train ride took about four days. First time I ever saw mountains. That was really impressive. They let us get out in Oregon and climb a mountain. Oh boy, that was great stuff. Roy Holden, Company 1633, Camp Lewis and Clark. My brother and I signed up in Buffalo, New York. We cried all the way down to the streetcar. My father took us down to enter us into this whole thing. Of course, we thought we'd get into a state park around Buffalo, but they shipped us to Camp Dix, New Jersey. And then we asked somebody, where's this place called Olga? And he said, I don't know, except it's out in Washington, and you'd better take your rain clothes. Ed Devine, Camp Moran. The official Three Seas Guidebook tried to keep things upbeat. You are a member of the Civilian Conservation Corps. For six months or longer, you will live in a camp, and with axe, saw, shovel, or brush hook, you will have a job in conservation work. It will be a great experience. You will get a kick out of it, and you will learn much. Created as an emergency program, the Corps was run by an unusual partnership of four federal agencies. Department of Labor supervised the selection of the applicants. The Departments of Agriculture and the Interior oversaw the actual conservation work, while the War Department, the Army, was charged with feeding, housing, outfitting, and transporting the recruits. For the first few months, camp conditions remained pretty basic. Enrollees slept in army tents and ate out of soldiers' tin mess kits until permanent wooden barracks and dining halls could be built. Eventually, the three C's would receive their own special forest green uniforms. But in the beginning, recruits wore what the army could find on its shelves. We got three complete outfits of clothing, as I recall, and a necktie. And they gave you a shaving kit, toothbrush outfit, and heavy army overcoats real nice and warm, all wool, just come out of mothballs. Been stored in mothballs, I think, since World War I. It was all surplus World War I clothing. Albert Cranfield, Saltwater State Park. 